Local Eye Almost Live Zoom, Someone Like You, hosted by Amy Amanti with special guest Christine Quintana. So welcome officially to everyone to almost uh, to this almost live event. My name is Amy. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the community outreach coordinator for Vocal Eye and your host for these almost live events and a member of the blind community. And before we get started with tonight's event, I want to just acknowledge that Vocali is broadcasting to you all this evening from the unceded and stolen territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil peoples. And as we are all gathered today over the magic of Zoom, I just would like to acknowledge these lands, and I invite you to uh, take a moment to acknowledge the lands that you may be settled on, and to acknowledge the harms and the mistakes of the past, and to look at how we can move forward in the spirit of truth and reconciliation. So it's an, uh, something that I offer you all to do a little bit of work around uh, the lands that you're settled on. Um, okay, tonight's Wednesday, October the 6th, the World CP Day. Um, doesn't have anything to do with tonight's programming, but I just thought I'd put in a plug. And tonight we're offering you our number 58, almost live event, 58, I can't even believe it. And tonight we're going to play Someone Like You, which is a, an arts club theater company's Listen to This audio play. And our special guest tonight is the playwright themselves, Christine Quintana. Welcome, Christine. I know you're with us. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to be here. I'm really excited to have you too. It's always a real honor when we have um, folks connected to the art in the space. Um, so I... I I don't even know where to start, Christine, other than to ask you about someone like you and um, whether this, uh, some of the audio plays that we've listened to in this space were originally designed for stage, for live stage. And I wonder if that's very similar to your experience with this, that you've had to pivot to an audio drama because of the pandemic. Yeah, well, I was very uh, lucky in that I had come up with the general concept. Um, so. Uh, the artistic director of the Arts Club, Ashley Corcoran, actually approached me about um, doing an adaptation of Cyrano de Bergerac, which is sort of a classic, it's a classic French play comedy. I think most people know it because of the adaptation Roxanne, starring Steve Martin from the 80s or 90s, I think, um, and asked me if I'd be interested in doing a modern take on it. And uh, initially I was kind of uh, reluctant because one of the big themes of the play, the kind of pitch is that um, Cyrano de Bergerac is this guy who has a big nose mm -hmm. and uh, he's in love with this woman, Roxanne, who's beautiful, but she doesn't notice him. And then Roxanne falls in love with his friend. And then he uh, helps write letters and on behalf of his friend and woos her and essentially she falls in love with Cyrano but she thinks she's fallen in love with this handsome soldier and I thought boy the world really doesn't need more things about body image and and beauty standards and I was like I'm not really interested in putting more of that into the world but then I gave it some more thought and I came to them with a specific pitch and they liked it and then the pandemic hit <laughs> and then in, uh, I was supposed to start work in September of 2020. And shortly after that, they approached me and said, Hey, we want to do the season as audio plays. Are you interested? And I said, well, sure. Give it a try. Um, and so I got to write it for audio specifically. And one of the biggest challenges that I think is really interesting, and I'm really interested to hear, um, afterwards from everybody is that, um, uh, there are certain things in this play that rely on um, seeing the actors on stage and a, a very key moment from the original that's um, a very distinct kind of joke that's uh, usually relies on sort of a, a sight gag and so trying to figure out how to do that over audio um, mm. and how to take the whole concept to bring it over to audio so I'm lucky that I got to what you heard was written specifically as a serial podcast yeah yeah so I mean all the um the listen to this uh, audio plays that the arts club has does just for context for folks who aren't aware is that they were releasing these as as podcast episodes so this was originally eight podcast episode like eight 20 minutes ish episodes um that were shared and then of course you could also purchase a ticket and just get the whole thing <laughs> you know right up front 
Um, so what was that experience like trying to write it in these segments? Because did it feel to you like you had to write sort of like a beginning and middle and an end for each, each episode? Because the dot, dot, dot seems like it would be kind of difficult for people who are waiting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I really wanted each episode to have a sort of satisfying arc unto itself and leave you in a space where you wanted to come back for the next episode. Um, So that was one advantage. One thing that was sort of challenging um, or at least a different, different way of working. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I really enjoyed about writing for audio is um, uh, things that would be not dynamic enough for the stage uh, are great on audio. So just having two characters be able to sit and talk to one another and not having to artificially move around the stage or have other things happening that it could just be really intimate and really simple in a way that might be a little boring on stage, but in the audio format is, is perfect. So uh, it was really, it was really a fun thing to kind of shed a lot of my assumptions um, and sort of try something, try something new, always with the audience in mind. Mm, I love that. Um, had you ever written for audio before? Christine, or was this your first kick at the can, so to speak? This was my first time doing that. And then I did it a bunch. I did a whole bunch of audio projects over um, over the course of the pandemic. I did a short audio uh, piece for the Stratford Festival. Um, I did uh, a piece for the Caravan Farm Theater. Um, and then I had one of my stage plays adapted for podcasts through Aluna Theater and New World Theater. So it was um, really fantastic um, challenges and, and I've learned so much. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been a thrill. Does, I, I'm curious now, as we come into, mm, it's even, I like, I feel icky even saying it, but you know, cause we feel like we, we're, we're so far in the pandemic that we should be coming out of it mm-hmm. on the other side and that keeps getting delayed a little bit but um I wonder if um as a as an artist as a writer as an artist if you will be thinking about like oh I have to return to writing stage pieces or if you're like yeah you know what I like this audio thing I might explore that a little further um the, the gift that the pandemic gave you I don't know how does that how do you incorporate that moving forward in your artwork well, I feel like uh, not taking things as a given is really great. Like, I actually think that some of the um, uh, some of the big questions about representation in this piece, which I think maybe what we should talk about after, mm-hmm. um, really gave me a lot of a lot of things to keep coming back to. And then also, like, honestly, um, the accessibility factor of having things online or in different formats is really interesting to me. And and the way that we can reach a wider audience and even like I've been able to see things by my colleagues in Toronto or abroad mm-hmm. and um, really wanting to keep that kind of sense of connection um, that I'm really excited about in addition to all of the sort of aesthetic theater formal stuff as well. Mm-hmm. And a lot of theater spaces now are, I have put themselves in a position where they are, um, like they have good te- technology for live streaming um, mm-hmm. Which is again one of those things that was birthed out of out of necessity for the pandemic, and so maybe there is this cool hybrid approach, depending on what theater you know company you might be working with for a particular show, to have something on stage and streamed at the same time. Um, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's something that yeah, I, that artists are thinking about, and I and I'm just curious about how how that relates, if that resonates with you. Yeah, I I feel like. Um, what I'm finding really satisfying is purpose-built stuff. Mm. So like I, if this play, if the arts club or another company wants to do this play, I will rewrite it a lot because Mm. I wrote this to be like a great serial podcast. And I'm even curious to hear from everyone after if it felt like it was episodes and not just like a straight through thing. Like I, I, I listened to it in the episodes. So I'm curious to hear what it sounds like kind of all in one go. Yeah. Um, And I did an online show called Good Things to Do that's specifically for doing uh, over the internet. Mm -hmm. And then I've done some sort of smaller performances for just two or three people at a time in person outside, like on the sidewalk outside people's house. And I love, yeah, I was part of a group called the Quarantettes. Actually, if you um, 
uh, go to uh, New World Theater's social media. We're actually doing a set of shows week after next. We'll, we will come to your house and sing for you if you want. Um, so that's that's my plug for that. But um, I find myself, I'm less interested in hybrid and more focusing everything on the audience where they are, whether they're at mm. home or they're in person and making sure that we take that experience all the way and make it as good as possible um, so that nobody feels left out. Mm, I love that. Um, I, uh, I'm curious about what we're going to listen to tonight because you've already flagged a little bit about representation. Um, and I know we'll unpack some of that when you come back for the Q and a, but maybe just set up for us, um, a little bit about what we're going to experience. If there's a content warning that you think maybe we should flag for us. I know, I think I saw on my, my podcast feed that it's rated explicit. <laughs> so there may be some, <laughs> yeah. Some there's a there's a couple of f bombs, but that's about it. I, okay, I, I would say as far as anything that I write, this is about as PG as it gets. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I was really interested. Like always, my agenda when I'm a playwright or a creator is, is how do I get people and stories on stage that we don't normally see on stages, mm-hmm. especially big stages like the Arts Club, where uh, in the past it's kind of been all the same kind of person that you see season after season, mm-hmm. and they're shaking it up, and I was like, okay, let's go. Yep. Um, and so uh, you'll uh, hopefully see sort of where I'm going with that. Um, and content warning wise, there is a little bit of content about um, uh, body image and body issues, um, about racism in the dating scene, um, and about abusive relationships. Um, yeah, so just to know about that. But there's also a lot of jokes. So <laughs> hopefully there's a joke warning too. <laughs> it's a joke warning. <laughs> it's a joke warning. That's terrible. I feel like now that I've said that, no one's going to think the play is funny because I put in the joke warning. Well, <laughs> you I were mean, too ready. <laughs> and, and that's, I mean, you know, with a platform like Zoom, it's not like you, you're sitting in an audience and you're hearing everybody laugh, right? So as we're all, you know, busting a gut on the other end, you'll never know until we tell you at the end. So exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, one of the hard things I find about performing on Zoom is that you don't get any audience feedback. And I'm so, as a performer, in tune to that piece of it. So it's been a bit of adjustment for me as a performer. But um, at any rate, my clock says that it's 700 Pacific time, which means Perfect. that we're going to play <laughs> someone like you. And friends, just so that you're aware, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a longer one than last week. So we're, we're clocking in at about uh, two hours and 15 minutes. But I think it'll be well worth it. Um, so, Christine, we will see you at the end uh, for a Q&A. And Rick, I'll get you to play someone like you. Due to copyright restrictions, this feature presentation has not been recorded. Please check below for more information, including links to the material if it is hosted elsewhere. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back, friends. That was someone like you. Uh, I got a little bit of a smile on my face with that one. Um, let's invite Christine back into the space. I know you're here. Ah, I got a square with Christine in it. I'm here, I'm here, hi. Awesome. Um, okay, so before I start asking you some questions, I wanna just uh, remind our audience that they are welcome to use the raise your hand function, ask questions, share comments. Um, Christine, before you, uh, at the top, when you had introduced the, the piece, you had mentioned um, that you wanted to know from folks if some of the jokes had landed for them, that kind of thing. So please feel free to, free to share friends. Um, in the meantime, I have some questions for you. First of all, I, I, I owe you a congratulations because you've been nominated for a comedy award that I don't think I can pronounce. <laughs> but tell yeah, us a little I, bit about this, this uh, award that you're nominated for. Yeah, I'm so thrilled and surprised and, and delighted. It's um, an award through the Playwrights Guild of Canada. Um, and it's their first ever award acknowledging um, comedies, which is uh, super cool and not something I thought was my strength. So it was a real honor to be nominated. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll find out at the end of the month. But the two Ooh. other nominated playwrights are fantastic. So it's a real, it's a real honor. It's one of those things that uh, uh, it feels like the Academy Awards where it's, it's the honor is just to be nominated because you're in such a good company. Yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. I love that. I love that. Tell me what it, what it felt like when, when you heard that you'd been nominated. 
I was just so, um, so thrilled. And also, um, you know, I think it's really, it's kind of neat. Um, Ashley Corcoran, who's the artistic director, when she approached me, she said, I read, uh, I follow you on Twitter and your jokes on Twitter are really funny. And I'd like you to write a comedy. And I was like, I'm not funny for the right reasons. <laughs> um, <laughs> so don't, I can't write a whole play. Like tweets are just 140 characters. Um, and I just felt really uh, grateful that she saw something in me that uh, let me expand my horizons a bit. Um, so yeah, that felt really good. And also like, I felt grateful that like, I feel like so much comedy is about punching down mm -hmm. and about mm -hmm. making cheap jokes at people's expenses, including the original Cyrano has tons of that. Yeah. And so I felt, I felt happy that I managed to write something that I, I think of completely avoids punching down, um, but still manages, I guess, to make people laugh. So I, I always uh, thought the rule of comedy was about punching up, right? Like you're yeah. supposed to take shots at, at, at folks who have more privilege than you do, not on the way down. Um, cause otherwise it's just icky. Yeah. You would think, but you watch any, like, I kind of lightly took inspiration from like rom-coms of like the late nineties, early two thousands and TV mm -hmm. shows. And you watch one of those again. And it's like, whew, it's like bad out there. Like friends, like age poorly, like most rom-coms that you're like, I love this. You put on now and you're like, Oh, that's, that's so that's yeah. That's so interesting that you say that because I think I, I loved friends when it came out and what was it? Maybe the nineties, I, I was in high school or something. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it's what's fun, what's interesting to me about that is this idea of place and time, you know, it was it felt like it was a different place in time. And so where I was as a human, I was really enjoying that kind of comedy or as I am today as a human, I probably wouldn't enjoy that kind of comedy. So it's an, it's an interesting observation that you point that out. Um, I, talk to me, Christine, about um, like what a typical day of writing is like for you as a writer, do you have a process? Do you, I mean, I know that you're sort of loosely basing this on, on Cyrano de Bergerac, but I, was that, was that, was it easier to write because you had kind of a framework or, or I don't know. I'm just curious yeah. about the writing process. <laughs> well, it's, it's chaos. It's chaos. Um, you know, you'll meet writers who are like, uh, uh, I, you know, I write, get up every morning and I like do yoga and then I write for two hours. Like that is not me. I'm like a, a total garbage fire. I like, I'm so last minute and right on the deadline. And something I found challenging about the pandemic is like, um, in my zoom screen right now, I have a white background, but that's because I have put up a screen because mm -hmm. I'm in my bedroom because mm -hmm. that is where my desk is. Um, and so I like get up move three feet over to my desk and that and so that's normally I used to go to coffee shops I used to go to writers retreats and so I've been kind of like really struggling with um being at home constantly and needing that kind of feedback so that's a big part of it and then also like for this I did a lot of um reading I I read um this great book by Aubrey Gordon called what we don't talk about when we talk about fat mm -hmm. and it's about the fat liberation movement and um in particular um she chronicles all of these really surprising avenues of prejudice against people uh including like medic like in medicine and dating and um even in interactions with police and workplaces yeah. um that really kind of gave me some grounding in in what Isabel's experience might be. Um, and then I also had a sensitivity reader. I worked with Andrea Warner, who's an amazing journalist and author and theater critic. Um, and uh, she identifies as fat, she identifies as a feminist. And so she read the script, an early draft of the script and gave me some feedback about how to make um, Isabel's voice feel a little bit more authentic um, and uh, to kind of, you know, for me to say, what what have you always wanted to see from a lead character in a rom-com who's fat? Um, and I was like, you name it, I'm gonna make it happen. So it was incredible to get to get to have some feedback from Andrea. So this process was like, like everything, every, every play is a completely new experience. And I'm really grateful for what this one brought me. Mm, I love that. Um, I, I would love for you, it may be obvious for some folks, 
some of the differences and some of the similarities between someone like you and Cyrano de Bergerac and, and, um, and Roxanne. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not, if folks aren't familiar with those storylines, maybe share with us a little bit about where you stuck maybe close to the storyline and where you yeah. like took a huge leap of modernization. Yeah, yeah. So in the original Cyrano, um, uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, so the whole thing is just that he's got this big nose and everybody can see it. And uh, there's this kind of one of the like really famous scenes is um, some, some guy at a bar, I think is like, you have a big nose. He goes, oh, you, a big nose, that's the best thing you can come up with. And then he just rattles through all of these euphemisms and these more clever ways of making fun of somebody's nose. And it's like, if you're going to make fun of me, make it good, make it count. Mm -hmm. But he also has this kind of deep um, self-loathing as well. And one of the things uh, when I got approached about this is Ashley said, you know, it'd be great to do a feminist take on it and kind of flip the genders of the characters. I was like, I'm not going to write a woman who hates herself. I'm not going to do that. Um, we get so many messages uh, in media and in life about how we mm -hmm. should all hate ourselves and buy things to make ourselves feel better as women. I was like, I'm not going to do that. So my twist is going to be that that's everyone else's problem. And she's like, I'm good. I'm, I'm at peace with myself. I'm good. Um, and then as well, Roxanne um, is the kind of female love interest and, and she's very idealized and very on a pedestal. Um, and so there is something subversive about taking a male character and kind of making him function slightly in that way. But I was more interested in, in letting that romantic interest have all the depth and complexity that the rest of the characters do. Mm -hmm. um, and then Christian is the, the Christian character. You see, I worked real hard on the names there. Um, <laughs> is this kind of like hot dummy, basically, uh, is, is, the, is the gist on, on Christian. He's a soldier. He's not educated. He like can't talk to Roxanne. He's got nothing to say. And that's why Cyrano ends up ghostwriting and speaking all these things. Um, and again, like I just wanted to add, add some complexity and in particular, uh, in particular to kind of flip the victim narrative um, on its head that abusive relationships kind of come for everybody um, and that it's not a judge in your character and it's not your fault and it's nothing that you did. Uh, and to write a character who's like smart and compassionate and driven and thoughtful and also has this terrible relationship that really derails her life for a couple of years and affects her relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and more than anything, it was just a thrill for me to like, make the real love stories of the piece, Kristen and Isabel and Isabel and herself. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, Harjeet's just kind of like a nice extra bonus that comes from resolving those two other things. Yeah, but it's not about needing, a, uh, uh, in this case, needing a man in your life to, yeah. be, to be fulfilled. Um, exactly. Uh, oh yeah, awesome. Um, I have a follow-up, but I see we have a hand from Megan. So I'm gonna let mm -hmm. Megan unmute. Um, and then we have a hand from Louise after. So we'll do Megan first. I'll just give, oh yeah, we got yeah, you. Megan. I, I, I just wanted to, to let you know that, that that was an amazing movie, um, show. That was the best, the best. And I, I, I loved it, especially like she, you know, her question was, was crying a lot, but then she started growing stronger and stronger and stronger. And man, did she ever grow strong? And that yeah. kind of show was, like wow, she was amazing. I I I highly loved her. I especially loved Isabel. She she you know tried to encourage her, you know, to do things to encourage her to like stop controlling her or anything, but encouraging her. But that was awesome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm smiling so big right now. That means so much. Thank you for oh, saying yeah. that. Anyway, I better I better uh, go because I have to get ready for for bed. A long night. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Megan. Thanks for listening. Yeah. If, if if I win the if, if I ever win the uh, um if I ever win a draw just, just send me an email and I'll be I'll be I'll be right there. All right. Okay. Thanks, Megan. All uh, right, Louise, you're up, and then we've got a hand from Nancy. Hello. Um, well, first of all, Kristen, I hope you win the the um award because it was fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind. <laughs> but I'm going to share something, how I saw the characters. 
And I'm going to say, I saw, I saw a bad relationship, but I saw, I'm going to relate to, um, to Isabel more. I saw a character that struggled with her own self image of herself. No matter what you're, if you're not, if it doesn't matter what you're, if it's a disability of any kind, that in a relationship, you think the one more beautiful beside you should be the one who has it. And I was going for her to get him at the end. And I'm glad he, they did get together and hope it works for them, but that doesn't matter. But the point is, is the self image of a person you portrayed that in her, that she, was un, she wasn't selfish for herself, more caring for her friend and wanted her happy before herself. That is something is called love, consideration, and you brought it across so uniquely. I, there was tears in my eyes at times, but not just tears, but understanding because I won my, you know, I'm not the most beautiful woman. I'm not gorgeous in the fat, but we're gorgeous inside. And the people who choose us to love us mm-hmm. is important. And that's the image you gave. And I, if maybe I'm, I'm reading something into that wasn't so supposed to be there, but that's how I perceived it. You made Isabel lovable. And oh, Christine, please. You're, you're so bang on. You're so bang on. Thank you for saying that. That's really meaningful to hear. That that's your impression yeah and that, it re- and, and that it resonated so strongly with you louise is really nice to hear too well thank you for for sharing it and as i say i hope you let amy know so she can share with the community <laughs> you win the award <laughs> thank you we will christine knows how to find me and i'll probably be it'll probably be everywhere on the the, the day after the, the night of the announcement yeah. but uh, it's really it's a really exciting thing um, Nancy, we have a question from Nancy and then we have a question from Josette. So Nancy, you can unmute yourself. Give Nancy a moment to unmute. While we're waiting for, for Nancy and it'll probably happen any second. Um, I'd like, I'd love to have you marinate a little bit on this, um, idea of writing these relationships because I was curious about, and I see Nancy's unmuted, but I'll ask the question, we'll let Nancy talk. (laughs) Um, But I was curious about whether the writing of these relationships was something that was familiar to you personally. You know, we always, you you hear that people write what they know um, and they seemed very organic and very personable. And I just wondered how much of that was your lens in terms of things you've experienced from your friends and your family and Oh, 100%. I mean, the other thing, you know, I have a lot of agendas when I write a lot of political agendas and I'm not shy about it, yeah. but I, I feel like in my life, my friendships with other women have sustained me and made me grow and made me a better person and challenged me and held me up. And I find that because so much of media is written by people who aren't women and also um, that there's lots of stereotypes that we get the competition, the competitive, you know, the bitchy women who cut each other down. That is not my experience in my life. And so I wanted to show another side of female friendships that was, you know, where the dark side is like codependency and like, you know, really uh, getting too involved or putting too much stake in each other's lives, but to show friendship that you're like, this is like a real life relationship that is like as important as any romantic relationship will ever be. And so I drew on many of the amazing women uh, in my life. Uh, and, you know, the, the Kristen Isabel friendship is definitely like a composite of so many people and be, and sometimes I'm Kristen and sometimes I'm Isabel. And um, yeah, it was a real gift to get to write those two. Mm, I love that. Um, Okay, Nancy, you are unmuted and thanks for waiting patiently. You did a wonderful job. You deserve to win this. You you brought back lots of memories um, by doing something for someone and then it backfired and I ended up marrying the person because I put my daughter, my sister's love letter and he ended up falling in love with me and he married me and my sister always put me down for that. But your role that you did is awesome. I like how you stuck up for yourself and 
you know, what we are judging and everything else. Louise hit the button, how I, what, what I wanted to say. And that, that brings us, you know, that you, you're, you're caring, for, that she's a caring person and she was there for her friend. Hmm. And the joke was really good. I like it when you wanted to go out there to beat him up and he wasn't there and she ended up saying she loves you and you loved her back and she came in the car and you guys left and the music was awesome. Living in the mountain or something, that was great. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. And yeah, the sound design was by MJ Coomer and they're a wonderful sound designer. They're a composer. Um, and I think that they did the sound design for the next Arts Club show. So you can hear more of their work because they did a really awesome job on the music, really kicked ass, it was awesome. Thank you. I just got, I just got to work with, with MJ from a distance, um, virtually on another project. So familiar with, with what they do and really, really cool sounds. Mm -hmm. um so thanks for 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 plugging that um because i did not realize that mj was a part of this uh piece as i didn't realize i just have to say and we'll, we'll maybe get a chance to talk about the cast in a moment um that my friend jasmine was uh was the voice of Kristen, and i heard it and i thought no it can't be and then i was like yes it is <laughs> So oh, we'll yeah. talk about that in a second because i have some questions about that too um josette go ahead and unmute yourself Oh, hi. I thoroughly enjoyed the play. Now, I must admit, um, and it's to do with my upbringing and, um, I don't know, the way people tend to talk to one another nowadays, uh, using F word, every second word and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I understand that, you know, because that's the way a lot of younger people talk today. Not all of them, but a great majority of them. And, um, uh, Please don't take this wrong, but I, um, I, I was going to turn it off for too, too many f bombs you know, for you in, in, during the first part because I found, uh, and I know this was the way this was written, and I understand all that, but um, I found in the beginning, um, and as time went on, um, I found that the characters matured a great deal. Um, so I stuck with it and I found it to be excellent, but, um, in the beginning, you know, um, they, there was a lot of arguing, arguing that went on that some of was very childish in my opinion, <laughs> but, um, I, you know, they did, they did mature and, uh, I'll echo, uh, the thoughts about, um, Isabel as well. I, I found that she really matured, um, towards the end too and um well it worked out that everybody <laughs> uh was happy in the end it's too bad that um Kristen didn't get the guy but anyway <laughs> <laughs> um I, I I really enjoy I really found it really well done and uh, congratulations on your award as well but um anyway if you could comment on the beginning part, so I, I, you know, I thought everything was well written, but uh, um, again, the, uh, yeah. the the the, the uh, characters really did mature towards the end. I thought. Yeah, you know, I just said I have to say, fresh out of saying that it's not that explicit, off the top, I was like, oh, there's a lot of swearing in this. I didn't even realize. So you're yeah, not well, wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was. Um, well, I was brought up in the 50s and early 60s, and, you know, people respected one another as even kids <laughs> back then. And I don't want to sound prudish or anything, but um, there, are, there is so much of this going on where, where I find younger, a lot of younger people, not all, but a lot of younger people don't respect their elders anymore and the way they talk to people. And I realize, yeah. you know, the, this is the way the play was written, but I was very impressed with the outcome of it. Yeah, well, I, I think you really picked up on, I, I kind of wanted to show off the top, but they're sort of in this arrested development thing, like they kind of slide back to how they were when they were like 21 at UBC, oh, yeah. and now they're like in their 30s and still kind of behaving badly. Um, but, yeah. you know, I have to say, if I get another pass at it, I'm going to pull back the language a bit. It's a little too much. So thank you for that comment. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to go to Lori and then we're going to go to Myra. So Lori, you're up. I'm, I'm, I'm already unmuted. Yeah, I can. I, we hear you loud and clear. Uh, you know, this was a very good play. It made me think of 
uh, two very good friends who are now deceased, how we all kind of grew up and you know got out of you know out of our twenties as as adults, and it just made me think a lot of them um, hearing this play and everything um, and mm. stuff. So it's just it it shows you know how we all can you know when we have good friends in our lives that uh, we all can mature and. and and straighten ourselves out with each other, <laughs> you know. And so it was, it was. It was a very good play. Oh, thank you so much. I'm. I'm really. I'm very moved that it brought up those those memories for you. Oh, thanks, Lori, for sharing your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Myra, Myra is joining us uh, from three hours in the future, so it's past midnight for you. <gasps> wow, thank That's you. That's right. For the future being very good, my dear. <laughs> I just want to say I love the play. I I was fast. At first I thought, well, maybe I could wash the dishes while it's playing, but I couldn't do a thing. I <laughs> just uh, glued glued to it. And I the thing I I really enjoyed as it progressed is the way not only what the characters were saying, but the way their voices changed. Um, the way Kristen became so much her her voice actually changed or to me it did it was stronger and and so it wasn't just what she was saying but the way she said it Mm -hmm. and the RG you know I loved RG I can see anybody loving him (laughs) and uh, the whole thing was just beautifully beautifully done so uh, congratulations on the nomination and I sure hope that you win and I can't wait to hear the next play that you have that we Mm -hmm. can have on on Vocali Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we'll have to poke you, Christine, to see if there's some more content you can share on this Hey, I do, I do have one that's going to be announced soon that's in the spring of 2022. So there you thank go. you so much. Thank you, Mara. Hey, well, it's wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And I love Vocal Eye, too. And Amy keeps coming up with just the most fascinating programs for us. And it makes oh, Wednesday night joy. It's not me. We've, <laughs> got, a, we've got Nice an to hear your voice. Ju- nice to hear your ne- voice, Myra. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Nice to hear your voice, Myra. It's Peg. I just wanted to oh, say. Peggy. Hi. Oh, Peggy. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> good to hear you too, Peggy. Yeah. Take care, everybody, and good night. And thank you very, good very night. much. It's a lovely play. Bye mm-hmm. now. Thanks, Myra. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about the cast, Christine, because um, first of all, it's a, a lovely, diverse cast, which I'm, sure, I'm not sure that people would be aware of. Um, but talk to me about who the voice actors are. And um, and I'm curious about whether you had any input into who was chosen. Yes, well, um, the lead, Isabel, is Stephanie Davis, who Ooh. is just incredible. She's just the, she is the best singer in town, like hands down, I'm saying it. Mm-hmm. She's a, just astonishing singer. Um, and she's just like criminally underused in the theater scene um, because a lot of, you know, directors and casting directors don't have a lot of imagination mm-hmm. um, and she doesn't get called in for nearly as much stuff as she should. So hopefully we see more and more of her on stages and she's just so funny. She's so funny and she has such a big heart and um, all of those things come across. Um, Jasmine Chen is um, uh, Kristen and I always wanted Jasmine to play this part because she's such a phenomenal actor. Mm-hmm. With Kristen, it's really hard to ride the line between uh, w- the judgments that you might have about Kristen when you first meet her and um, what she's hiding underneath that. And the fact that she manages to share that um, just through voice acting, I think is incredible. And then Praneet Akila is Harjeet and uh, I'm just like stunned that he was able to record it because he is on a million Netflix shows he's on Salem uh, Motherland he's on Nancy Drew he's on a new NBC show he's like a big TV star now and he's got the you know movie star (laughs) vibe to go with it as well um, but it's just like the sweetest, dorkiest dude you'll ever meet. And so he was really perfect for, for Harjeet, who's just a sort of tortured dreamboat. Um, and all of them brought so much of themselves to the parts. And I'm just so grateful that that was our fantastic cast. Do you want to go to bed? No, no, don't worry. Friends, I'll ask you if you can mute yourself if you've got some background noise going on. That would be helpful for 
for uh, for us. Um, thank you, Christine, for sharing with us a bit about who who this cast is because I think that's um, I, I love it. And and for uh, our audience members, Jasmine, who played Kristen in this piece uh will be uh in k body and mind which we're showing two weeks from now uh mm. she's performing in that piece as well so october is going to be a month of jasmine chen <laughs> which yeah, will be love that. totally cool yeah i'm totally i'm totally psyched about that um so that's fantastic stuff um i wonder are you shared a little bit christine for uh, uh, with us about what's coming up next but is there anything that you can you know go a little deeper into sharing with us what you're working on? Yeah, I'm working on um, a new play for the Belfry Theater um, that's just in development. Um, and that one is kind of about uh, the science of trees and how trees talk to each other and how our human relationships might kind of mirror that. Mm. Um, and then I have a, a new play called Clean. Um, and in Spanish, it's Espejos, and it is a bilingual play. So there's a Mexican character and a Canadian character, and I'm Mexican-American on my dad's side, and I'm a white settler on my mom's side. And um, I wrote this play about this interaction between these two women that happens in a resort in Cancun. And it is happening um, uh, in the spring, and it's gonna be a fully bilingual production, um, which I'm really, really excited about. And there's currently um, a podcast excerpt available um, in English through um, Aluna Theater's uh, pod, uh, podcast. So um, uh, that's just a little taste of it. And then the full thing's coming up in, in the spring. Awesome. Lots of uh, exciting stuff. And you've been really busy during the pandemic. So. Um, I, you know, I, I hesitate always to, to say that the silver, that there were, that there are some silver linings to the pandemic, but I think, um, as artists, there have been some opportunities there to explore and to grow and, um, and that doesn't diminish the, uh, or oversimplify the hardships that have come with the pandemic too, because there certainly has been enough of that, but, um, where we can find the silver linings and learn from that is probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, everyone's been saying theater's been dying since, you know, it was founded and uh, we have, we're not gone yet. So yeah. I don't think the pandemic will be the thing. It won't be the end of it. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Christine, for joining us in the space. But before I let you go, we have some official raffle business that we have to take so care excited. of. So yeah, um, uh, I'm going to invite Sarah into the space. Um, and Christine, I, I, I challenged you to think of a, a, a word instead of the boring old stop. Um, so I'm hoping you've got a word on standby. You don't have to share it yet, but uh, Sarah, I'm going to leave Christine in your hands for the raffle. Oh, hi. Um, thanks, Christine. So anytime you're ready, please just call out a word of your choice. Okay. Oat milk. <laughs> um, our our winner is Kareem. Ah, oh, Kareem is he still on the line with us tonight. Let's make sure that Kareem is still on the line. I see them. You see them? Oh, your eyes are better than mine, Christine. So if you see them. <laughs> yep, I'm still here. Ah, oh, you're still there. Welcome. Congratulations, Kareem. You got a raffle prize. So, um, yeah. And so it's wanted to say it's a. Uh, very good ad adaptation of Cyrano, especially the the talk about the comparison of fat person versus Cyrano's nose. Ah, mm. thank you so much. Oh, and the, and, the, and the really good funny part about the sign that said, please date me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that little tidbit too. Um, Sarah's going to explain to us what this raffle prize is all about because it's a special one for this week. Um, so Sarah, I'm going to let you just share a little bit about what the, what Crims has won this evening. Okay, so I also work for the Vancouver Writers Festival, and it is our 34th season this year, and we return to Granville Island for a hybrid festival for in-person and digital events. Um, so tonight's prize that Karim has won is a digital pass to the festival, which includes dozens of programs you can join from the comfort of your own home. And I, along with the box office team at the Vancouver Writers Festival, will be assisting 
getting the winner access to all of um, the digital events and um, we will make it as seamless as possible possible. So um, for anyone else who's interested, the festival runs from October 18th to 24th, and we'd love to have you there. We have some excellent um, local, provincial, national, and international authors, including Pulitzer Prize winners, um, Booker Prize winners and nominees, and our very exciting guest curator this year is, um, is Lawrence Hill. So um, that's going to be really exciting. And Essie Adujin, who is a Giller Prize winner, will also be pre presenting the Massey Lecture this year. We have Miriam Taves, we have Doug Copeland, we have Evan Osnos and Andre Alexis. So it's going to be really exciting. Those are and a lot actually, of funny enough, I'm contributing a piece to the cool. Literary Cabaret. Um, yes, yes. I'm, I'm writing the host script for the Literary Cabaret. So there'll be a little bit of my writing in, in that that as well so that's awesome <laughs> there we go full circle moment cool i better block off the whole week <laughs> well especially if you're uh, a lot of folks on 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 that join us are audiobook fans right and so the idea of being able to listen to writers talk about their work and learn about new works might be really interesting to some folks so krim will make sure that we get uh, you your your digital pass and um connect you with whatever festival things you want to see. So stay tuned and, and we'll reach out to you with that. Awesome. Um, Christine, thank you so much again for joining us this evening. I really hope that this is not the last time we see you in this space because it's really been a joy to have you um, talk to us about your work and share a bit about what you're doing. And I, I wish you all good things to come. So thank you for joining us at Vocalize. Thank you so much for having me and thanks everyone for listening. Vocal Eye, vocal eye Special thanks to our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the British Columbia Arts Council, the Province of British Columbia, and the City of Vancouver. Mm -hmm.